Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a blackberry cider. What do you have, Del? I am drinking a peach daiquiri, and on this week's episode, we are going to look at the story of Mary Kay Letourneau. Mary Kay was a teacher who created a scandal when it was discovered that the Mary teacher was having an affair with one of her students, Billy Falau. Let's start with some background on Mary Kay and how she met her future student. Mary Catherine Smith was born on January 30th, 1962 to John and Mary Smith in Tulane, California. She was raised in a strict Catholic household and her father was a successful local politician. Her father's career ended when the public found out about his extramarital affair with a former student with whom he had two children. This part of her childhood is something that she repeated in her later years. Mary Kay attended Arizona State University and met her future husband, Steve Laterno. They married in 1984 and had four children together. She later stated that she was not in love with Steve and only married him because of her parents urging her to. They moved to Alaska and then to Washington where Mary Kay graduated from Seattle University with a teaching degree. She got a teaching job at Shorewood Elementary School, where she taught second grade. And this is where she met Billy Falau, who was one of her students in her second and sixth grade class. Their relationship started platonically and turned sexual in the summer of 1996 when Billy was 12. On June 18, 1996, police came upon her in a car with Billy in a marina parking lot. She was seen jumping into the front seat while Falau pretended to be asleep in the back. They both provided false names when asked for identification, and Falau lied about his age. He told the police that he was 18. Laterno said that she and her husband had gotten into an argument and that Falau, who she said was a family friend, who had been staying with them that night, witnessed the argument and ran away upset. She said she left to find him. Laterno and Falau were taken to the police station where Falau's mother was called. The mother was asked what should be done, and she said that Falau should be returned to Laterno's house. She later stated that if the police had alerted her to the fact that Laterno had lied about Falau's age and what had occurred in the car, she would not have allowed her son to go back to Laterno's home. Steve's family and friends had become suspicious of Mary Kay's relationship with Billy. They contacted the police and Mary Kay was arrested on August 4th, 1997 on two counts of felony, second degree rape of a child. It was then that they discovered Mary Kay was pregnant with her and Billy's first child. Their daughter was born while Mary Kay was awaiting sentencing on May 29, 1997. The prosecution wanted six and a half years, but after a plea agreement, Mary Kay was sentenced to six months, with three months being suspended. Her plea agreement didn't require her to register as a sex offender, but she did have to agree to not have any contact with Billy, any of her children, or any other minors. This story was picked up by the tabloids as people close to Mary Kay said her mental health took a sharp decline. Even though Mary Kay was under strict instructions to stay away from Billy, she did not listen. Two weeks after being released from jail on February 3, 1998, Mary Kay was caught by the police in a car with Billy near his home. They again provided false identification, and Falau told a detective that he and Letourneau had kissed frequently and that he had touched Letourneau on the thigh, but that no sexual intercourse had occurred. There was evidence the two had met several times since Letourneau's release from jail. While serving her second jail sentence, Letourneau gave birth to her second daughter on October 16, 1998. Because of her notoriety, Letourneau was unpopular with other inmates. She, quote, sassed guards and balked at work, end quote, and reportedly as punishment for this spent, quote, 18 of her first 24 months, end quote, in solitary confinement. In one instance, Letourneau served six months in solitary when letters she tried to send to Falau were intercepted. Falau dropped out of high school and his mother was granted custody of his two children. He struggled with suicidal depression and alcoholism, attempting suicide in March 1999. 
In 2002, Palau's family sued the Highline School District in the city of Des Moines, Washington for emotional suffering, lost wages, and the cost of rearing his two children, claiming the school and the Des Moines Police Department had failed to protect him from Laterno. Following a 10-week trial, no damages were awarded. Laterno was released from prison to a community placement program on August 4, 2004, and registered the following day with the King County Sheriff's Office as a level two sex offender, which indicated that she is likely to reoffend. After Mary Kay's release from prison, Lalau, now 21, petitioned the court to lift the no contact order. Laterno and Falau married on May 20th, 2005 in the city of Woodingville, Washington. In a 2006 interview with NBC News, quote, Laterno conceded she knew it would be wrong to let the relationship go any further, but she says as soon as the school year ended, she and Billy did cross that line, end quote. She said that, quote, it did not cross her mind, end quote, at the time that having sex with Falau would be a crime. On May 9, 2017, after almost 12 years of marriage, Lalau filed for separation from Laterno, but later withdrew the filing. The couple did finalize a legal separation two years later in August of 2019. Laterno died at the age of 58 from cancer on July 6, 2020, at her home in Des Moines, Washington. Lalau and her family were at her side despite the divorce. In her last will and testament, Laterno left much of her estate to Falau. Jenny, what do you think of the Mary Kay Laterno story? I remember hearing about this case for the first time when I watched a Lifetime movie about it. It's just gross. I don't know like what else to say. I think that's the best word to sum it up. It's really troubling and she definitely deserved to be in jail. And it's ridiculous to hear her say the first time they had sex, she didn't think it was a crime. What about it isn't a crime? That they loved each other? It doesn't matter. He's 12 years old. It's disgusting. We all know that's morally wrong. It's criminally wrong. It's inexcusable. I think it's really wild that they stayed together as long as they did too. I remember SNL when they got married making jokes about it and saying that, you know, the bride wore white and the groom wore Spider-Man trying to insinuate that he was a child still. So we'll talk a little bit about this later, but it really did just seem that everyone was making a big joke out of it. And despite what his mom said, I feel like she did really support this relationship and let things happen. I will say I never knew that Villy was depressed and suicidal and turned to alcohol after this. And I didn't know about her time in jail and her attitude either. So I think that's kind of interesting. It definitely seems like she was a pretty entitled person. What about you? Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think this case is gross and disgusting. And I think that the fact that she was given so many chances to realize that her actions were wrong and it just seems that she didn't care. I do not believe that a well-educated person like Mary Kay didn't know that sleeping with a child was illegal. I don't believe her. I think that she thought that that would be a convenient excuse and something that she would be able to tell herself to make her feel better about the actions that she perpetrated on Billy. I think that Billy's mom definitely has some culpability in this. The fact that she repeatedly let Billy go over his teacher's house was really strange to me. You know, I definitely understand like letting him stay after school, you know, so that he can get additional work because that was his teacher. But once he was moving on to the higher grade levels, I'm not sure why she didn't sense that something was wrong with this relationship and that it had gone a lot further than Billy and Mary Kay were leading her to believe. I do think that she got a really light sentence. And I also think that it's strange that after the first time that she was charged, she wasn't required to register as a sex offender. We're going to talk about the gender disparities a bit later, but I definitely think that that was owed to her gender and her attractiveness. Yeah, that is really shocking and pretty upsetting too. I would say that she didn't have to register as a sex offender. What does it take then in the state of Washington? 
Mary Kay Letourneau's case shed a light on the abuses and exploitation of children that can happen within schools. According to the U.S. Department of Education, 1 in 10 students will experience school employee sexual misconduct by the time they graduate from high school. 60% of the victims are female, typically from low-income backgrounds, and 75% of the perpetrators are male. Research has shown that school employees whose jobs include individual, isolated, or alone time with students, such as music teachers, coaches, and counselors, are more likely to engage in sexual misconduct. One teacher offender can have as many as 73 victims, according to a 2010 GAO report. While studies of the effects of school employee sexual misconduct on victims are limited, we do know that victims of sexual abuse by any adult suffer serious psychological, physical, academic, and behavioral consequences that can last a lifetime. Victims of sexual abuse are more likely to have problems with drugs, alcohol, or substance abuse, and they often struggle with long-term symptoms such as chronic headaches, fatigue, sleep disturbance, recurrent nausea, decreased appetite, eating disorders, sexual dysfunction, suicide attempts, fear, anxiety, depression, anger, hostility, and poor self-esteem. Sexual abuse also impairs victims' ability to trust other people, potentially destroying their chances to develop close personal relationships, and especially healthy sexual relationships. I'll be honest, I hadn't really ever looked into exploitation of children within schools, but I definitely believe people get into certain professions to hurt people or exploit or take advantage of them, and I think teaching unfortunately can be one of them. I don't think this kind of behavior can be predicted necessarily. We mentioned coaches and coaches abusing young athletes definitely came to mind. I don't know if anyone knows the journalist Lisa Ling, but she did one episode of one of her shows on coaches that abused children. It was really interesting to hear and it was really heartbreaking to see. We mentioned some of the repercussions of children that face sexual abuse. They're also more likely to end up in prison too. There's a sexual abuse to prison pipeline. It sets you up to lead a really difficult life and it's really sad that people, you know, have so much power over someone else and when they exert that awful things can happen. It's really sad because it's sort of normalized almost. What about you, Del? What do you think? I definitely agree with you. I think that people that want to hurt others always find a way to do it. And unfortunately, there are very evil people in this world that want to hurt children and know that the easiest way to have access to children is to get into the educational system. Also, I think that there is a question of accountability. I was looking into this and a lot of times this is not reported. Because of fear of retaliation, maybe the child doesn't have anyone to go to. Abusers typically pick their victims based off of their own sick, twisted attractions, but also they pick victims that they feel like they can get away with their crimes if they perpetrate the acts upon them. I think it just becomes a combination of factors that leads to not only increased victimization, but also a decrease in accountability for the abusers. The Mary Kay Letourneau case was unique because it focused on a male victim. While the general public agrees that abuse is wrong, there is a societal downplaying of male victims, especially when their abusers are females. It is commonly believed that men are less negatively impacted by sexual victimization. However, there is some evidence suggesting that sexual victimization is as psychologically distressing to male victims as it is to female victims and might even be associated with poorer outcomes. Although the prevalence rates of sexual victimization shows it is quite common for both men and women, Care and treatment are primarily targeted at female victims. For instance, sexual assault referrals and care centers are frequently steered by gynecologists and often located in gynecological or maternity wards, which may create a barrier for men seeking help. An online survey on help seeking and the needs of male victims of intimate partner violence in Portugal reported that men found the formal sources of support like victim support services, police, and the justice system unhelpful. 
the level of knowledge about male sexual victims still falls below that of female victims. Most research on the effects of post-rape trauma has focused on female victims. Jenny, what do you think can be done to increase the supports available to male trauma victims? I think on one level, it starts with breaking down these really harmful stereotypes and ideas about men that we have within our culture. I think in a lot of Western culture that they always want sex, that they can't be raped and they're expected to be having sex. And if they're not, they're losers. We need to believe male and female victims of assault and really validate them. I'm glad you brought up the need for services for men because everything that I've really seen is for women, which is definitely needed, but men need services as well. And I'm sure the way you would treat a male victim would be different than a female victim. So I would say probably more funding to get these services known, created, funded, publicized, all of that. I think part of this too might deal with better sex education that might be able to play a role in increasing support and ensuring children or victims um, of any age will be respected when they come forward. And I think part of that sex education is really teaching people about their bodies, when to know something isn't right, when to know you're uncomfortable and what to say. Because no one should be put in a position where they can't say no and they are not being taken seriously. What about you? I definitely agree with you that we need to have a concerted effort into increasing the funding available to places that support male victims. And I think that as a society, we need to make sure that we're not reinforcing toxic masculinity and all of the things that go into that. One of the ways that we can do that is, like you said, having that comprehensive sexual education that really talks about female victims and male victims and the unique signs that go into because I remember in school they would tell you okay these are the typical signs that someone's been abused but when you look more into the actual studies they use females for that and the question is can that be applied to males well we don't know because the research has not been done when many people think of this case, they think of the double standards that exist when discussing cases involving male versus female predators, especially again when the victim is male. The media has painted a vastly different picture when it comes to male versus female offenders. Male offenders are often given longer sentences and it's less likely people believe that they can be rehabilitated. Male offenders are often seen as creeps, which they are, but somehow female offenders don't receive the same treatment. People often praise males who have had relations with their teachers, but that definitely minimizes the severity of the teacher's crimes. Jenny, what do you think of the double standard that exists between male and female predators? First, I definitely agree that there is a double standard. I think it's finally starting to change based off of some critiques of media that I've seen and what I've seen on social media for better or for worse. But I think it's hard for people to understand that women can be sexual predators. And again, I think that comes from our society, really, that we don't view women as sexual, sometimes even having like a real sexuality or enjoying sex. And like I said, the idea that men always want sex, male, like we said, male predators are creepy and female predators, they get these like cute and sometimes sexy nicknames, they're cougars, their victims are applauded and not seen as victims. So many times people would say, oh, I wish she was my teacher to Mary Kay Letourneau or some other teacher that was caught having sex with a 14 year old student. So I think once our culture gets more educated, that will change. And I hope that does continue to change. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything you said. I think that the double standard is real. And I think that it's one of those things of people are way more cautious of putting negative labels on female offenders. And I think that they are way more apt to try to high five victims, which is so strange because we talked about earlier the psychological impact on victims. And we talked specifically about what happened to Valau and the trauma that he suffered. And he's someone who ended up marrying his offender. And that's definitely rare and not always the case. So when you put it into that perspective, I think that we definitely need to make sure that we are not creating additional expectations on male 
or female victims of female perpetrators to somehow think that their abuse was okay. To think that, oh, it could have been so much worse because I could have had a male doing it. I just don't think that that's right. And I think that we are creating additional barriers for people seeking help from abuse if we try to treat the abuse as not that bad or not as bad as it could have been. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the Mary Kay Letourneau story. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode focused on the death of Lavina Johnson. As always, stay safe.